This is the Art Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the Amazon best-selling book, Make More Money Selling Your Art. In the Marketing Minute, we answer your questions to help your art career. Brought to you by artmarketing.com, the place to go to learn more about marketing. Now, here's your host, art magazine publisher, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping, and thank you for joining us today. I am here, my goal is to eliminate the idea of the starving artist. So let's get right to today's questions. From Mark Maserat in San Francisco, California. Specifically, what goes into a newsletter and realistically, how often should I send it out? Well, first off, you want to be consistent. You always want to send it out consistently. I think you want to be at least monthly and you probably want to say, send it the exact same time every month so it's consistent. Everybody knows they can look forward to it. That's the easy part. Now, what about newsletters? Well, the problem with newsletters is they're all about you. And you may be interested in you, but you'd be surprised how many people are not interested in you. So you've got to have something in that newsletter that people are going to be excited about reading that they're going to learn from. Now, learning something from you or about you may be part of the element. Now, John uh, McDonald's probably got one of the best newsletters I've ever read because he's, he's targeting artists in that particular newsletter, probably so they'll come to his workshop or buy his amazing video. But you, he's always talking about new concepts, and he's basically writing a chapter of a book with every newsletter, and every one of them is really valuable. So when, you know, when I'm deleting the literally hundreds of newsletters that come to me, every month. I can't read them all. And I know a lot of your collectors and a lot of other people feel the same way. They're, they're going to open the ones that matter to them. So you want to have information, not just about you, but things that are compelling. What can I learn from this? What's interesting? In our art marketing in a box, we actually pre-wrote a year's worth of newsletters, and it's got information in it about um, uh, you know, art history and some things they can learn about artists and things that just kind of make it a little bit more fun and exciting. Then you can still put that stuff about you in there, but don't necessarily lead with it. But put something in there that is telling your story, uh, vividly explaining the story behind a painting or a trip or something that you've been doing, and try to make it interesting. Be entertaining, because if you're not entertaining, if you're boring, nobody's going to want to read it, right? So don't be boring. Last, consider not sending it by email. That's right. I know that sounds crazy, but, you know, it's so easy to delete email. You know, if you have 50 or 100 people on your list, it's not a big deal to send by mail. You're printing, you're uh, getting big, rich, colorful images, and if it's really well done, people don't want to throw it out. So you might want to consider that. Uh, we're having really good luck with direct mail again lately because nobody does direct mail anymore, so everybody else does email. So this is a good thing to consider doing. Next question is from Penny Markley in Winthrop, Maine. I wonder where that is. Somewhere in Maine, obviously. She says, nothing is more puzzling than pricing. I hate pricing. Prices uh, Are prices below $10,000 and negative? And should prices be posted on a website? Well, you know, there's. A, I'll, I'll answer the last part first. Prices on a website, um, yeah, probably. A lot of people don't do it. They want to make people call, but a lot of people won't call if they... These days, you're used to being able to get the price. I had a, a gallery tell me he debated this. He put the price of a sculpture on. It was six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. He came in the next. Uh, he came in one morning, and there was an order and a wire transfer for six hundred and fifty thousand dollars waiting for him. Somebody who bought the sculpture. So that's why having the price is a good idea. Um, it's going to turn some people off, but it's going to turn them off anyway if it's a price they don't like. The idea about pricing is uh, there's a lot of psychology behind it. It's very emotional. Low price sends signals of poor quality. Now, price is also dependent on size, right? So a smaller painting is going to be a lower price than a bigger painting. So low price in a smaller painting doesn't necessarily send a poor quality signal. Uh, there was a lady who came to a tent show one time. An artist told me that he, she said, how much is the painting? He said it's four. She wrote him a check for 40, 40,000, handed in the check. He said, ma'am, that's a mistake. The painting is $4,000. And she said, well, it must not be very good. She ripped up the check. So um, depends on who your market is. You got to know your market, know where you're selling your art. The environment matters. I mean, if you're selling at a flea market, you're not going to sell expensive paintings. If you're selling in a high-end gallery, you're going to sell expensive paintings. Uh, because you're in the environment. You know, it's kind of like I always make the analogy is you don't sell a Mercedes or a Bentley in a flea market because there's nobody there who can afford to buy it. 
So you want to put that Bentley in a place where you know people can afford to, to buy it. Where are the affluent people hanging out? And that's the same thing with art. And that's why great art galleries can do you a lot of good because they already have lists of these people. They have contact with them. They're coming into the gallery. So uh, lots of books out there on pricing. I highly recommend you pick some up uh, because you can learn a lot about pricing and the psychology of pricing. So I hope that that helps a little bit. Uh, there's probably a ton of other things I could tell you about pricing. One that comes to mind is the, uh, what's called the law of comparison. If you have a great big painting in a gallery, let's say it's a 30 by 40 or 40 by 50, and you've got a very high price on it, uh, suddenly you are considered to be a high-priced, high-valued artist by the person who sees that, especially if the price is visible. Then you've got a couple of 9 by 12s or 11 by 14s hanging next to it, and they are, in contrast, a much lower price. They, and they might be higher price than you normally get, but because it's next to that big painting, uh, you can get that higher price, and people will buy it because they feel like they're getting a bargain. Anyway, just a thought. Well, this has been the Art Marketing Minute with me, Eric Rhodes. My goal in life is to eliminate the idea of the starving artist and to help your dreams actually come true. So if you want to submit questions, simply email eric at artmarketing.com. And to learn more about marketing ideas, you can visit artmarketing.com. Thanks for listening.